Support Microbe TV. It's time for our annual fundraising drive. We depend on your support to produce high-quality science videos and podcasts. And now is the time to help us. If our programs have appealed to your science interests, or if they have helped you in some way, please record a brief audio or video with your phone and tell us about it. Let us know how we empower your inner scientist. We'll use it for our fundraising efforts. Send it to incubator at microbe.tv. And for more information on how you can give us your support, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV. This Week in Virology, episode 1165, recorded on November 1, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, everybody, and um, it's good to be back. Not that I was away, mind you, but I am. Um, uh, I'm glad to finally have made room for myself on such a popular podcast as as ours is. The weather outside is unbelievable. It's yeah, just it too good to be true, and it's true, and probably it's too good to be true because. It's a say, it's a symptom of something that shouldn't be happening, and I think it's a, a shame that we have to call this a good day when it might be one of the worst days that Earth has ever seen at this time of the year. I was sitting outside before because the sun is lovely. It's 25C here. Exactly. Humidity, very low. The, the leaves are swirling around, right? The, they're all falling down, and it's really Yeah, low. and there are brush fires all but, over Long Island. But... And, what I can't stand here in the burbs, mm, ah, right? All the leaf blowers. Oh my god! Exactly. We were in Montreal doing a twiv. And they started blowing leaves right outside the window. If you remember, you know, okay. Also joining us from Montreal, Canada, Angela Mingarelli. Hey guys, I'm so happy to be back. I haven't been here in I feel like at least two months. Uh, so it's not as warm here. It was yesterday. Yesterday it was like 23 C. Today it has already dropped to 11, no, sorry, 13C, which I think is like 55 Fahrenheit. So it is still very warm for November, but it has dipped from yesterday. Uh, yeah, I remember that episode remember where that. <laughs> the, the leaf blower was outside the window. Actually, there was one outside my window like 20 minutes ago, and I was like, please, please stop blowing these leaves. And they have, they have stopped. Um, but yeah, it's great to be back. Excited to talk, to see you guys. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 50 Fahrenheit, which is 10 Celsius. From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Uh, it is a lovely midsummer day here in Western Massachusetts. It is 82 Fahrenheit, 28 C. Um, that's one of the palindromic temperatures. Humidity is 31%, and we have a red flag warning, meaning elevated fire risk. Uh, outdoor burning, not recommended. I haven't grilled in weeks. Um, and on the topic of leaf blowers, my neighborhood sounds like a giant frickin' hornet nest for four <laughs> months out of the year. Yeah. It's awful. Hey! Brianne's back. <laughs> not that she's been introduced or anything. <laughs> also or joining rich. us from Austin, <laughs> Texas, Rich Condit. Hi. Now I'm here officially. Hi, everybody. Uh, it is cooler here in Austin, Texas than in wherever it is that Alan is. Western, Western Mass. Mass. Wow. It is 78 huh. degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is, Celsius. Um, and uh, uh, the Weather Channel says we're headed for 81. Eh. Uh, 25C. So Tuesday, Monday night, there's a cold front coming through uh with some attendant rain, I hope. Rich, what's a cold front in Texas? Is that like 72 instead of 80. Uh, exactly. It's going to drop <laughs> right. to 73 on Tuesday. That's right. That's Very right. cold. Uh, Tuesday front. night, according to the forecast, is going to be 49. That's genuinely cold for Texas. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Uh, great to see you all and actually have my tech working. Um, it is 77 and sunny here. So uh, just a little cooler than Rich. 
So we have seven Twivers here. We're, we're just too short of a complete team. This is very close. We know we rarely get this close. So this is good. It's kind of cool. You see so many squares. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need seven people to do these papers. Yeah. <laughs> With all when the papers, we it's true. When we were talking Actually, about we're just gonna have we're gonna have Brianne do it and everybody else just listen. Oh perfect. <laughs> Sorry, we'll guys. Just go, uh -huh, I was just gonna say when we were uh -huh. talking about leaf blowers in Ann Arbor, they passed a law that uh phasing out gas blower leaf blowers. That's oh, right. Good. Gas powered leaf blowers so they yeah, can yeah. only be able I know, to I, know, I wish have, we could do the uh, same. All of my yard equipment is uh battery powered. Right. Lawnmower, trimmer, string trimmer, leaf blower. And it's right. so much it's so much better than the gas powered stuff. Yeah. No maintenance, all works well. You know what I still have a gas mower, but I when it dies it's being replaced with electric. You know what's even I better than all that? Living in an apartment and not <laughs> having an to do any of those things. <laughs> I was gonna say living someplace where you don't have a yard. That's right. If you enjoy these conversations about science and other things, we'd like to have your support. In fact, November December, the last two months of the year, these are our main fundraising months. So we, we would love to have your support. Uh, we, we depend on listeners to produce these shows. We don't do ads. And most of the support comes from you, individual listeners. Very little corporate support, uh, but mainly from listeners. So this is the time. And in fact, if we make a difference to you, if we appeal to your inner scientist in some way, if we've helped you record a little uh, audio or video, it doesn't have to be long, and just uh, say, hi, this is so-and-so from Sowhere, and um, tell us how, how it's helped you, it, because you are the best evangelist for fundraising for us. When things when you like how th we do things, uh, that's, that really sells it to others. And there should be a... Um, a little video before this uh, episode explaining that further, but we're going to have a an email uh, set up for you to send audio, and then if you wanted to send a video, we'll have a Dropbox as well. But the main site, the main page for con contributions is microbe.tv/contribute, and, and we'd love to have your support. Sadly, Diane Griffin passed away on Monday, October twenty eighth. Dixon, you may remember you and I uh, did a twiv with her Indeed. in Hamilton, Montana. Indeed. Twiv, 453. Oh, my gosh. Indeed. What year would that have been? Uh, many moons ago. Uh, 2018 <laughs> or before. <laughs> because, yeah, exactly uh, right. Exactly because right. Because Twiv 500 was 2018. That's right. You know, go to the YouTube page. No, it was a lot of... 2017. You can't, even, you can't even find out the date just by going to the... You have to go to Microbe TV. It's August anyway. 6, 2017. 2017. Gosh, that was Seven. ages ago. Anyway, there's a nice uh, thumbnail with me and Dixon and, and <laughs> Diane. She was amused. It was a little audience, but it was a lot of fun. So she passed away on uh, Monday. Big, big, big person in virology. She was at Hopkins, of course, and um, did many, many things. She became chair eventually and was chair for, what, 15 years, served on many different committees uh, in the National Academy of Sciences before, of course, many journal uh, editorships, uh, lots of honors, and really amazing body of work. Um, viral infections of the nervous system, uh, acute viral infections, incomplete clearance of viral RNA. She was the first to say, hey, you know, after an RNA virus infection, at least in mice, RNA persists for a long time way beyond infectious virus, which we know, but apparently pundits don't know. But she was the first to establish that. Um, that and, and her excellent work on measles are the big things I think of. Measles too, yes. Yes, measles virus and protective immunity. And, and yeah, She's one of these scientists who, um, you know, when you, when you learn about her, it's like, wow, you know, if she didn't exist, it would be necessary to invent her. <laughs> because it's like, well, how did we figure out this? How do we figure out this? And it... She did that. Or, or, or in her case, it'd be necessary to invent three of her. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because she did so many things. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, I got to meet her many times and always liked talking to her very much. Uh, you got from Diane, she, she was a straightforward person. You ask her a question, she gives you an answer, and you knew it was either the right answer or she would say, I don't know. 
And I like that, right? Because a lot of people, you can't tell what you're getting. <laughs> and that was never the case with her. Um, so 84 years old, uh, long career, good stuff, worked really hard, never said no. So we have a little letter from Arturo Casadeval, who's at Hopkins. And he says she never said no to anything, any committee or being on TWIV. I'm glad we got her. She was a president of American Society for Virology and president of American Society for Microbiology. And I think if I did the arithmetic right, she was actually department chair for 20 years. 20. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And many. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> Every, lots, everybody who's been in academia is like, oh, my God. <laughs> lots of uh, service to the National Academy and other yeah. committees related to that as well. And just a real champion for trainees. The first time I met her was because she invited me to speak at a Gordon conference. And she looked out for me and was very supportive and helpful, friendly. Um, so I, I just think a lot of her and she will really be missed. Okay, one other news item from SIDREP. USDA announces the first H5N1 in f detection in pigs. Detection. This was a backyard farm in Oregon where the you know the owners of the farm they had pigs, they had chickens for their own purposes. And uh, recently the chickens came down with H5N1 infections. And uh, now uh, these pigs, there were five pigs on the farm. I think two of them were tested positive, you know, by nasal swabs. We don't know if they're actually infected or not, or if this is contamination, at least of as of this article on October 30th, and it may be more up to date by the time this episode is released. So um, there are no change. They sequenced the, the genome of the virus. There are no, none of the changes that you would associate with mammalian adaptation. So that's good. Uh, and But on the other hand, you know, pigs can be infected with lots of different influenza viruses. So the possibility for reassortment is certainly there. Although, Does this also mean that every single pig that comes to slaughter will be examined? Uh, I doubt it, right? I doubt it. I doubt it. I mean, all these yeah, pigs I doubt were, it. <laughs> these pigs were Probably slaughtered. Probably not. All the chickens and the pigs were slaughtered. Um, but they might do well, random sampling at the slaughterhouse. That would make you sense. You could. Like random, out um, of every the, lot. Yeah, the, the pork in your supermarket is not coming from a backyard farm like this where there are chickens. Um, it's coming from facilities that are all pork, right? Exactly. That, are, that are specialized, at least in this country. Um, that yeah. is not the case everywhere. And this obviously shows that what we were afraid could happen can happen. This virus can jump from birds mm -hmm. to pigs, um, which is one of the steps you see in flu viruses and Although, spilling over. Again, we don't know if it actually infected them yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't know if it infected them. And Mike Osterholm says... Earlier scientific work suggests that the virus doesn't easily infect pigs. H5N1 doesn't easily infect pigs. So we'll see. We have to wait and see what happens. Yeah. Actually, it'd be interesting to see uh, because they got it in their noses. Uh, will it, will it uh, uh, actually establish uh, an infection? <laughs> that's, a, that's an important data point. Yeah, yeah it was actually yeah. Um, described really nicely in um, the ProMed um, post about this. Um, I, I just loved how they phrased it. Um, they said something like, uh, you know, yes, it might just be an environmental contamination of the nose. Uh, and that was Osterholm's. Pigs like to rub their noses yeah, in, the, yeah. in the ground. Right? Uh, yes. That was a they quote from Osterholm. Noses. But I just felt like that was a, a good way of phrasing it. Uh, and I yeah. liked reading that in the ProMed. Poor piggies. Too bad. They even have a different name for their nose. What's that? Yes. Snout. Snout. <laughs> you know, we have two immunology papers today, so I have an immunology joke. I was really excited oh, 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 about what that. I saw that, that too. Oh, so my dear. I, someone, on, someone on the live stream Wednesday night mentioned this, and it was just perfect. I don't know if he just made it up on the fly or what, but he said, you know, I never get sick on weekends, only during the week. I have a weekend immune system. Ooh. Oh my gosh! But I'm bummed. <laughs> it's good. a Dixon it's joke. Pretty good, right? 
Mm-hmm. I can see. Um, Alan, does? what do you think? <laughs> I, I, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. it's all right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you have to be a cognoscenti to get weekend and weekend. No, I, no. Think, you, I no. think I think you can. You don't need to be. You know, I think that's generally cute. appreciated. It's well, cute. that line first appeared in a Groucho Marx movie, by the way. It did. Mm. It did. So oh, how, did, it, it, how did it appear there? In fact, that it was it was a sexual uh, reference because Mrs. Oglethorpe asked Groucho Marx how was his weekend, and he says, "I'll oh, thank you not to ask about my personal affairs if you don't mind." His weekend, his weekend. Mm, but I'm bummed. Yes, he got away with that. <laughs> it's so a variation on that though. joke. Yes, he got away with that, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, she threw Onto up her arms and walked movie. off. But I, I've seen that movie twice now, and I, <laughs> I believe it's called uh, Night at the Opera. All right, to the literature snippet: <laughs> Nature communications, innate immune control of influenza virus, interspecies adaptation via IFITM3, IFITM3. I fit, I fit into it. Parker Denz is the first author. Samuel Speaks, Adam Kenny, Adrian Eddy, Jonathan Papa, Jack Rudiger, Sidney Scase, Adam Rubrum, Emily Heeman, Adriana Ferrero, Richard Webby, who was on TWIV not too long ago, Andrew Bowman, and Jacob Yount, corresponding author. These individuals are from Ohio State uh, University's College of Medicine, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. I fit M3 is a very cool protein, uh, which is actually mentioned in my virology lectures. It's an interferon induced protein. As you know, interferons themselves don't have antiviral activities, but they induced proteins that do. And in I fit M3 is one of many. Um, it's, as they say here, it's, uh, it's at low levels in most cells. It's induced by interferon and it associates with membranes. It's a really cool um, membrane uh, topology. I put a, a, an image in here. It has a transmembrane domain, and then it's, it goes through the membrane. Then there's a second uh, transmembrane domain, which kind of sits laterally, and then there's there are a couple of glycophosphatyl and acetyl anchors that make it stick in the membrane. It basically deforms the membrane so that viruses can't get into cells. Viruses that fuse their membranes with that of the host cell doesn't work. It's very cool. So it can limit infection by a bunch of uh, envelope viruses, including interfer uh, in influenza viruses. And HIV. I, I, have, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does this have uh, uh, any other jobs? Was it evolved to do this? Well, I, I don't know. Um, it's a, interferon induced proteins, you know, they, are, they tend to be just antiviral, right? right? But um, it, what's interesting here is that a certain fraction of the human population has uh, nucleotide polymorphisms uh, that uh, either uh, impact its splicing or uh, the, the promoter of the gene. In fact, they're very common. 20% of Chinese individuals are, are homozygous for, for the splicing variant, and 4% of Europeans are homozygous for the promoter SNP. And I'm going to talk about this later, but turns out that IFIT-M3 interferes with placental development, which is mm -hmm. catalyzed by an exapted retrovirus a protein called syncytion, right? It causes fusion of that outer layer of syncytial yeah. tropoplasm. Okay. And this would interfere with that. So apparently, that is what people think uh, is the reason for this selection of this negative uh, activity. But why only in... China and Europeans, why not the rest of the world? They have yeah, the way, the way I kind of got this working is um, <clears throat> presumably there was some historic or prehistoric infection or multiple infections that swept through these groups mm. that made it much more likely that you would activate your IFID-M3 and, you know, have trouble forming a placenta and then you wouldn't have kids and you wouldn't be in the gene pool and that obviously would be selected against. Um, and so that okay, yeah. kind of suggests, you know, there was some pathogen that caused this this transformation. Yeah, I mean, I also kind of wondered whether, um, because as we see in this paper, there is uh, some 
situations where viruses might be um, you know, interacting with this differently, that perhaps um, there has been, you know, selection just for us to have some diversity um, in this um, so that viruses can be blocked. And an unfortunate downside of that diversity is that some of the diverse forms um, have deleterious effects. And so we're kind of still in the arms race with pathogens of um, selection here. Um, but that also may be because I've been thinking about some immunological things that work that way. So these these deficiencies in IFID M3, as you might expect, are associated with more severe infection, more severe influenza, more severe COVID. Um, so in this paper, they ask, um, is there a role for IFID M3 in influenza virus infection and maybe inter interspecies infection, the emergence of, of new uh, viruses? And so um, they start by some infections um, in, in mice. They have wild-type mice and mice lacking the gene for IFIT M3. And they infect them with different doses of an H5N1 avian influenza virus, 1, 10, or 50 uh, tissue culture infectious doses, 50%. And the interesting thing, and then they look for viral replication in the lungs. Uh, for, for the wild-type mice, with one TCID50 is not enough to get an infection going, but in the IFIT M3 knockout, it is. So it lowers the barrier. It makes less virus be able to establish infection. So I think that's pretty cool. They also look at markers of inflammation in the lung, which would be caused by infection. And again, they look at IL-6 and in interferon beta. Can't find them in, in wild-type mice infected with one TCID50, but it's certainly above baseline in those... Uh, I fit M3 knockouts that got one. And they also did it with H7N3 virus and get uh, the same results. Okay, so that's in mice. As we know, mice are not human. So mm -hmm. next they try human cells. They have A549 lung epithelial cells, and they try a bunch of different influenza viruses from avian swine and human influenza viruses. And they, um, they, they knock down uh, I fit M3 with the uh, siRNA and they find base and, and they, they find the similar result that you can you can reduce the amount of re replication of these viruses in the uh, absence of uh, ifid m3 and um, you you can you overall yields are reduced and you can use less virus to establish an infection they also use a macrophage cell line called thp1 and find the same same results So the idea now is that IFID M3 increases the minimum dose that you need to establish an infection in mice and in human cells. Okay, Which so, could make it much easier for a spillover to happen. It could, right? Yeah. If, uh, if a virus spills over and it's not very good at reproducing, maybe you mm. get if you don't have IFID M3, uh, it would do better. So that's what they, they test now. So, well, it seems like uh, in... In macrophages, um, these are human macrophages, the THP1, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That yeah. by adding yeah. back interferon beta, there's more of a difference. Like there's an increase in relative infection compared to the lung cells, I guess, A549. What cells are those, exact, are those exactly? Epithelial cells? Uh, I think uh, so. I, I didn't check because. Don't use you mean I, the THP1 cells? No, THPs yeah. no, are, are macrophages. Those are macrophages. Okay. Yeah, uh, A549, a, a, as I recall, were a, a human lung cancer cell line. Yeah. Is that correct? Epithelial yeah. cell line, yeah. Epithelial, yeah. So it's interesting, though, because like by adding, adding back interferon beta, you can see that there's a significant in some of the influenza strains that it's almost to the level of the IFIT M3 knockout by adding it mm. back. Like to the in, but compared to the lung, it's not as much to the epithelial cells. I thought that was interesting. THP one beta by itself. THP ones are super interferon responsive. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So they did an adaptation experiment. They decided to um, adapt human viruses to mice, so they wouldn't get into trouble with any adapting <laughs> mouse viruses to humans. Um, and what they do is they do lung to lung passaging. They use an H three N two virus uh, 10 times through either wild-type mice or IFIT null mice. So intranasal infection, um, you allow 
some time for the virus to reproduce, then you, you sacrifice the mice, you take out the lungs, uh, you you uh, grow you grow up whatever's there, and then you do that ten times, and then at the end you take samples over the ten times and infect new mice and ask what's happening. Are there are there any viruses that can infect the, the, the new mice? Did, right. I don't so think by you. 10 times, you mean this is like serial passage. Serial ten yeah. passage. Take but it from they're a not, mouse and put it in another mouse. They're not growing it up, though. I think they just take the lung homogenous. So like I've done this before where you just like magnalize the lungs and then using like a shaker no, they, with No, they, they do expand it in MDCK cells. They, they do? Right. Yeah. Because you yeah. can do it directly by spinning down... Really but high. They, did, they, they expanded it in MDC. Okay, cases. they did. I did. Okay, yeah. sorry, I missed that. Uh, Maybe they and, tried it and they didn't get enough. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is conceptually, this is like a laboratory spillover. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Don't say that, Rich. People are going to uh, think. Yeah, careful. There. Yeah, careful <laughs> yeah, with those yeah, words. So People are going to think that. It's, it's, it's a human. I don't want to spill anything in the laboratory. Rich. Call it, so, okay, <laughs> spill back. It, okay. It, it's, so, it's a mouse to mouse spillover <laughs> event. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Well, you're starting oh, with a that, human virus. As long as it doesn't require resuscitation. Yes. <laughs> so the that reminds me of mouse mother to mouse mother. Remember mm -hmm. that? With yes, 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 yes. So we got, we're passing them in either wild type or knockout mice, and then we are infecting wild type mice to see mm -hmm. how they go, right? So early passages, no difference between the knockout and wild type mice. But from passage five onwards, they saw more... Uh, Higher titers uh, in the knockout mice when they infect the uh, the wild type mice, uh, in terms of a log increase in in virus reproduction, which you didn't see from wild type mm -hmm. mice. So only the viruses passed in knockout mice five times and more showed an increased ability to replicate in um, the wild type mice in this experiment. So if the virus infects some uh, mice or potentially people who have um, a defect in IFIT yeah. M3, then the virus can adapt, and that adaptation allows the virus now to infect wild type uh, yep. better. Right. Mm -hmm. the, essentially, it's like the host is attenuated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this I, is like counterintuitive, right? Uh, or is my intuition messed up? <laughs> because you... Uh, I. In, Intuitively, I would think, and they're going to discuss this later on, I would think that if you passage the virus under conditions of less restriction, that is the IFIT uh, mm. uh, minus thing, that it could get lazy and lose its defenses against IFIT so that when it was confronted with IFIT again, it would be worse off. But in fact, you observe the opposite of that. It's actually right. I better off. And I don't, to me, so to me, that's counterintuitive, and I don't understand why that would happen. Well, if well there, are other, there are other aspects of the host biology that it has to deal with besides IFIT. And so by knocking out IFIT, you've taken out one problem that would otherwise make the infection much harder. The virus is able to use that to perhaps replicate to higher levels, complete more cycles, adapt better to other aspects of the host. And then when you reintroduce IFIT, it's better adapted to kind of the, the base level and is able to proceed from there. So let me Would stick something thinking. in here just for pedantry's yeah. sake. And that is, Rich, you can't say, why did that happen? Because it did happen. <laughs> what you have to say is, how did that happen? Mm. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. Rich understands pedantry. It's okay. Pedantry is yeah. part of the deal. <laughs> yes, it did happen. And I uh, learned that from Kathy, by the way. <laughs> it's calling anyway, everyone out. <laughs> they repeat this experiment, and they get the same results uh, in a different set. of it's Same virus, different mice, of course. They get the same results. But here's the thing now that you want to know, what if we release, uh, remove some other kind of uh, innate barrier, not just IFA3, but what about all interferons, what are we going to see? And then do the same passage experiment. So they, uh, instead of the IFIT null mice, they use STAT1 null mice, where all the signaling downstream of interferon, interferon receptors is disrupted. So interferons are not going to induce any ISGs. And they do the passage experiment, as before, uh, in wild-type and STAT1 knockout mice. And then they take the virus and they infect wild-type mice. 
now they see downward trend in infection. Is it the opposite of the IFIT M3? Now they see what Rich expected. Yeah, mm -hmm. what yes. Rich expected, right? And they say the in the absence of pressures from interferon, the antagonism mechanisms of the virus are become less active. And then in a wild type system where there there is is interferon, then those viruses can't compete. So interesting, right? So uh, it's uh, uh, going back to the original experiment because you. You went over, I realize this is a snippet, but one of the things I, I, I highlighted was the fact that they did the whole series of experiments again. They say, since virus adaptation is a yeah. stochastic process, we independently repeated our H3N2 virus pathogen, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, uh, yeah, very cool. But I'm also wondering, is that reviewer three? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I can see them sitting around at a lab meeting saying we really should do this yeah, uh, again, uh, and some people uh, complaining. Make, uh, make sure yeah. we didn't just get lucky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. really mm -hmm. excellent, really excellent. But that yeah. was that was good. Yeah, and mm. then I, I, you know, my question was about: Well, are they now? I want to know what's different about that virus, that adapted mm -hmm. virus, yeah, and absolutely. you know, I, which they will. I want to start thinking about how is that impacting. I, I fit M3 and all those kinds of things. And so the, they do have some sequencing here. Um, and um, it's nice that they've, you know, done it twice so that they can see um, things that are in common um, yeah. between the two passages. Um, and so they make some comments about changes that might happen, but I could imagine, you know, lots more future papers um, looking at how those types of changes in the virus interact with I fit M3. So, so in preparation for that, they did the same experiment in STAT1 knockouts, uh, in, uh, sorry, IFIT M3 knockout mice using an H1N1 strain, the, the 2009 pandemic strain. So now we're going to have an H3N2 and H1N1. They get the same results as with the H3N2, and then they'd sequence the genomes of those viruses. And interestingly, in the H3N2, they just see some minor variants uh, but nothing that jumped out as a change in the virus that's responsible uh, for this phenotype. But for the H1N1s, they got changes in the nucleoprotein and a change in one of the polymerase subunits. That's a known uh, adaptation to mice. You need that change to uh, reproduce in mice. Um, so the two passages gave uh, different results, but they are in different influenza virus strains. But you could now go back and introduce those individually and see what effect they have. And it could be that it, you know the, the adaptation to mice simply involves more reproduction, which was allowed in the absence of IFID M M3. Anyway, that's basically the experiments. They conclude that adaptation to influenza virus to a new host species is accelerated in the absence of IFID M3. Uh, and that's driven by mutations that emerge in the uh, host that doesn't have I IFID M3. I think it's pretty neat. So they say three, they made three <laughs> fundamentally important discoveries. First, uh, the IFID raises the, the minimum infectious dose that you need to infect human cells, also in vivo in mice. Second, uh, IFID M3 is a barrier to pandemic virus emergence, uh, most likely. A and third, um, IFID M3 uh, restricts infection of human cells by potentially zoonotic viruses. And they, they make an interesting uh, suggestion that we maybe sh might want to consider broad testing of IFID M3 status in the human population, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure you just want to look at IFID M3. I think you need to just do the whole genome and have a, a catalog of all the potential uh, SNPs that might affect you, but that's the future of medicine. Yeah, well, yeah I was wondering uh, Every 50 newborn. years from now, if we're still <laughs> around, uh, I wonder if uh, we'll have a database that is a thorough uh, electronic record, medical records on everybody, including a genome sequence, so that we can just mine that, okay? Yeah. And understand uh, the relationship between a person's genetics and, for example, their well, their history, their medical history of various diseases, infections, et cetera. Yeah. So you and use that to deny medical care coverage. <laughs> yeah. Good. 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 
Go back and see Gattaca. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, but we already have some uh, testing that we do of genetics, you know, for instance, PKU and, and things like that. And so this just adds one that might be feasible to mm-hmm. test and then additional mm-hmm. ones along right. the same yeah. lines. Well, right. I think the other thing that would be useful there is, you know, we know about these, you know, two big SNPs that are deleterious. Um but there are probably other SNPs that are in IFID M3 that maybe don't have such a dramatic effect that we haven't thus far as- associated with, say, viral infection levels. Um, mm. And so perhaps if we tested more IFID M3s from more people, we could find additional sort of genetic links to viral infection that we didn't know before. Could also imagine one day you have a child and oh this your, your child is defective in IFID M3 but we have a a virus here that will restore IFID M3 which you could give to them right or we could know they should get vaccinated yes get vaccinated you know awesome. but you can imagine people are going to try multiple things because that's how scientists are they want to try everything that's cool speaking of reviewer three I was speaking of reviewer three I saw yeah. a meme the other day of Somebody with a Halloween costume that consisted entirely of a placard around their neck that said reviewer number three. It was supposed to be like one of the scariest things around. The scary costume. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) I like that very much. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. This doesn't necessarily smack of reviewer number three. No, no. I'm going to say they did it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. If you're listening, authors, let us know. (laughs) No. Okay, paper number two, Immunity. It's a journal named Immunity. Antiviral innate immune memory in alveolar macrophages for following SARS-CoV-2 infection ameliorates secondary influenza A virus disease. Oh my gosh, one virus can infect affect another. Woo! Uh, first author, so we got um, these authors contributed equally. Okay, we oh, got this, a first author, author Alexander Lurcher, yes. and then we have co second author Chong, Bale, and Jang. Then we have Hoffman, Ashbrook, Louis, Yin, Quirk, De Grace, Chiriboga, Rosenberg, Josephowitz, and Charles Rice at the Rockefeller University Wild Cornell Medicine Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and New York University Medical Center. This is a New York thing here. <laughs> That's a good, pretty short author list considering how many experiments were done. Oh, I am very yes. impressed. <laughs> so uh, last year, was it, Brian, or two years ago, we did a immune in Hawaii? It was two years ago. Two years ago, and we talked about this idea that innate immunity can have some kind of memory. Yes. Yes. There are, there are a few uh, that's, that's been, you know, kicking around in immunology for a while. Um, and there are a few ideas about innate immune memory, although um, some immunologists get a little picky about that um, <laughs> and will sometimes use instead of innate immune memory, um, the phrase trained immunity. Um, and immunity, so trained right, immunity right. is the other phrase that we sometimes hear instead of innate immune memory yeah. um, here. So here they call it antigen-independent inflammatory memory. And the idea is that it's it's changing the epigenetic state of a cell. So, so as you know, DNA runs things in the nucleus, <laughs> and DNA is wrapped around proteins, and those proteins can be modified, and that's called epigenetically, to affect the transcriptional activity of the DNA can turn it on or off or somewhere in between. And so the idea is that this, so a path detection of a pathogen by the innate immune system somehow results in a modification of the epigenetic state of, of the chromatin. Uh, and um, it could make re- those cells more responsive to another infection. And, you know, and this, how long- This differs from the classical view of innate immunity that I learned in college which is that it's this generic response to certain motifs that always kind of runs the same program, like, oh, that's a pathogen, let's, you know, inflame in this particular way. Mm -hmm. This is a more nuanced, not terribly surprising, I guess, in retrospect, but 
it's definitely yeah. a new idea. Yeah, usually, like I said, people sometimes get picky about using the word memory on this. <laughs> um, and when we talk about adaptive immune memory, the idea is that we have adaptive immune cells that are really, really, really specific for an individual pathogen. Um, they may have experience with the pathogen. Um, and after that experience, they will um, have, they will, you know, undergo a lot of divisions. They'll change in some way and they will now react differently because of their past experience. So, you know, they're changed mm. by their past experience. Um, and alternatively, innate immune cells don't have that same kind of specificity for one specific microbe, they are responding kind of to any old microbe. Um, and the idea, the big picture idea with trained immunity is that those innate immune cells can also be changed by their experience. So if they experience um, one microbe, they are going to somehow be changed and act better. But now since they're not specific, they might act better against other stuff, not just the first thing that they saw. They, right. they give us an example the tuberculosis vaccine, BCG, uh, it induces innate immunity. Of course, it induces adaptive immunity to the pathogen, but it also induces innate immunity that lasts for months. And they say it reduces child mortality called by, caused by other infectious agents. And you may remember at the beginning of the pandemic, before we had vaccines, people were saying, take BCG or mm -hmm. measles vaccine, an infectious mm -hmm vaccine, even polio virus vaccine, maybe you get a couple of months of this kind of protection, right? I don't know that many people did, but that was the idea. It's this kind of trained immunity that was at play. So that's that's the... Um, Which at least would have been less harmful than some of the other things that were being promoted early <laughs> in the pandemic. Yes, yeah. yeah. But again, it's not going to be forever. It's, I don't know right. how long the longest, but maybe a couple of months at least for BCG, that's how much the protection lasts. Yeah, it kind of gooses the throttle a little bit, but then things go back to where they were. In this paper, they have a mouse model of infection, and they ask, if we infect with one virus, are we going to get changes in the epigenetic state of antiviral genes in specific cells, as you'll hear? And then if we infect those mice, are they going to get any protection from that? I was... Happy to see that they're using the mouse adapted strain from Ralph Barrick's lab and not the K-18 transgenic uh, <laughs> mice with SARS-CoV-2 because we know that there are a lot of caveats with those mice that overexpress the Yeah, there's a die, right? Too. So here you need mice that live. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's a lot more representative of like the disease, even though it's still yeah. a mouse. It's much better, the virus, that the yeah, MA-10. So, so, so they use C-57 black mice. Uh, and they used the SARS, uh, the mouse adapted MA10 from Ralph Barrick, who talked about that early on in the mm -hmm. pandemic here on TWIV. And you infect them with SARS CoV 2, they, they lose body weight and then they recover. 20 to 30 days, they're good. So that's, you have mice that you can do experiments with. That's what you want. You don't want them all dying, right? Yeah, exactly. And you don't have a system. The virus is gone in 15 days. Um, and they confirmed that no antigen or RNA in lung tissue at 30 days. And so they then look at gene expression of antiviral genes, you know, like IFIT M3, for example, <laughs> that we just talked about and others. Uh, and um, they're, they're no different in 30 days between um, the, the infected and the, and the control animals. They look at many, many different immune cell types. They're all pretty much the same with the exception of CD4 and CD8, which are higher uh, in the Infected mice, as you would expect, right? Memory cells. At, at day 30, you them. would expect that. Yeah. So uh, the, the recovered animals don't have inflammatory responses or tissue pathologies after they clear the virus. Okay, so then they say, does this infect an infection lead to some epigenetic change in cells, airway resident cells, all right? And so they, they do single nuclei <laughs> sequencing in using techniques that can assess the chromatin state. I don't want to go into them because it would take too long, but they have very cool names. All right, but they, they take bronchial alveolar fluid, so they're taking all these cells uh, out and they're doing single nuclei, nuclei sequencing. Like just to give you an example, 13,622 single 
nucleati- nu- nuclei. Uh, most of them from macrophages. So the one right. thing I will say is that while these do have cool names for these techniques, I feel like there's a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, the <laughs> it, This is the usually referred to by an acronym, which would be SNETAC, SEEK. Um, and I really feel like they needed to get another C or a K in there so that it could be a snack yes. attack seek. <laughs> snack attack <laughs> seek, yes. Anyway, they find most of the transcripts are similar in the recovered and naive macrophages. But there are some differences, and they see differences in the chromatin accessibility, right, of certain transcription factors that are involved in antiviral immune responses, uh, transcription factors associated with type 1 interference signaling, for example. So these are in the airway resident macrophages in mice. The, the ones who've recovered have certain epigenetic changes that are not in the naive mice, and those are involving regulation of uh, antiviral genes. That's that's a summary of a lot of data, mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's the best that we can do. And so, yeah. and so you might hypothesize be... that now, because of these changes, it's easier for these cells to get triggered again. I would use the word poised. Excellent. Yes. Yes. The cells are poised. poised to go off in a certain direction. So this is in mice, right? So next they say, does this happen in humans? Before we go on and spend five years working on this in mice, let's just see. And so they have a patient cohort that they got early in, in the pandemic. Uh, and they have um, patients who recovered from infection. Uh, these are So there were mild infections. And they got BALF from them. And they, again, did the single nuclei sequencing. And, again, find... Uh, find uh, increased expression of genes related to uh, immune defenses, as we saw before. So uh, epigenetic changes uh, in areas that regulate the transcription of um, the immune genes, very much similar to what they they saw in mice. So they feel confident that this is a mechanism in both mice and humans. These mice didn't lie. <laughs> no, <laughs> right. Not. Okay. Um, they they want to know what kinds of macrophages in the lung are involved. So th- th- there's a whole series of experiments where they look at markers of different cells, uh, and they basically conclude that monocyte-derived alveolar macrophages, MDAMs, uh, have a limit, make a limited contribution to this airway resonance. Another missed opportunity. If they could have just wedged an A in there <laughs> after the first M. Madam. <laughs> Madam. They, they make a limited contribution to this, um, uh, this, this effect in these mice. So I guess here, okay. to give like some context for people that don't know what alveolar macrophages are, they're like in sure. your alveoli, they're kind of lining the air sacs in your lungs and they're kind of like sampling the lumen of where we're breathing constantly. And normally, Brian, you can correct me, but I'm pretty sure alveolar macrophages are seeded very young, like embryonically, and then they are replenished over time, but it's a very slow process. It's not like, like post, I think it's like in cystic fibrosis, they get pretty destroyed and then there is seeding of new alveolar macrophages with monocytic populations and like post-viral infections. But in this case, I wasn't sure if they were talking about when they say monocyte derived, do they mean like from birth or do they mean, because that would always be, right? Or do they mean post-infection? Yeah. So I also was sort of confused about the same point. Um, I was kind of thinking that when they were talking about the monocyte derived alveolar macrophages, versus the resident alveolar macrophages Mm -hmm. that the monocyte derived maybe were coming from like bone marrow derived monocytes. Like, yeah, like post-inflammation. Or post-inflammation or post being born. Mm -hmm. Um, While the resident ones maybe are coming from say yolk sac or something and were actually Mm -hmm. developed in the, in the lung with the lung and have been there all along versus ones that came in later. They use the word infiltrating when they're talking about these MDM. Which would have been, because later on they do experiments with like CCR2, which is the important for 
the influx of mag- uh, monocytes right. post-infection, I guess. So I guess they mean infiltrating mag- monocytes that then differentiate into macrophages. Yeah. In case that was unclear, sorry. So monocytes then turn into macrophages in the lung. They differentiate. Um, uh, so back up again now. And which of these subsets of macrophages are showing these changes? The ones that are showing the changes are the ones that were part of the lung and that Mm -hmm. developed along with the lung, not the ones that infiltrated and came in from another source. So the ones born there. Resident alveolar macrophages. A paper that we did some time ago about the role of alveolar macrophages in Mm. defense against flu, as I recall. Mm -hmm. That they were the absolutely the first line of defense. That was Juliet Morrison. Okay. And these are these are Numerous. These are like the most numerous macrophages or or something in the lung mm. they mentioned. They're very important in lung immunology. Mm. These are very abundant and important cells. And so in the next set of experiments, they actually sort out these airway resident macrophages and confirm the epigenetic changes in the chromatin that would favor um, transcription of uh, immune defense genes. And then they say, Okay, we, we, we see that the chromatin is open. So open chromatin means it's easily transcribed. Yep. Mm-hmm. But we know there are specific modifications of histone proteins associated with open chromatin, in particular methylation. They're called marks, histone marks. And there are a bunch of them like H3K4ME, methyl 1, et cetera, et cetera. So they use a, se- a sequencing method called cut and run. <laughs> See, that's a perfect acronym. They need better ones. Cut and run is a beautiful one because it is literally (laughs) C-U-T-R-A-N. It's called cleavage under targets and released using nuclease. You know they did that exactly to get cut and run. Of course, of course. So then they can uh, uh, figure out what kinds of marks, and they see the marks are near genes that are involved in uh, uh, antiviral activities, right? So that's cool that you know exactly what the marks are. So basically they say, here's the this is the epigenetic antiviral memory program in these macrophages, in SARS-CoV-2 recovered macrophages. So that infection has induced the, the opening of this chromatin um, in, in these macrophages. So I right? wanna I wanna go back to uh I have a question before we go much further. So my alveoli are lined with these dudes, right? They're, they are plentiful. Um, the, They're women, actually. <laughs> oh, I think dudes is kind of like guys, isn't it? It's oh, true. I, I, it I, think, okay. I think I say dude. I, I do also men. say dude. I, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. got you, Rich. So um, <laughs> this is twiv, folks. So um, when they sequence these nuclei, they're not seeing these changes uniformly in all the nuclei, are they? No, no. It's a it's subset, just right? Some. It's enriched enriched over the enriched. naive mice, right? So I have uh so uh another question that's part of this is these alveolar macrophages, uh how did they say somewhere here that they live a couple of weeks? They're they have a they turn over with a with a doubling time of like two weeks or something like that, if it was the same cells, I'm wondering how they regenerate. Yeah, the next experiment they last 32 days in cultures. When they say that, also Brienne. Okay, yeah. so I have I have a little I have some qualms with this. I don't know. I didn't actually look into the supplementary figure because they said that they looked at differentiation markers to make sure that these were still alveolar macrophages after 30 days. But considering I've done BMDC cultures and I've done macrophage cultures and monocyte cultures, and they're such heterogeneous populations, I don't know how much of an alveolar macrophage you could be after sitting in a dish for 30 days. And if you have an epigenetic change... That's not necessarily propagated when that cell divides, correct? Uh, it may be propagated when the cell divides, but it may not be uh, measured by a differentiation marker like a protein. You're not going to see yeah. that by a cytometry. Um, but the idea is that the epigenetic changes can um, be transmitted when the cell divides. Mm. So you see where I'm going with this. I'm wondering, uh, uh, from the very beginning with this whole paper, I'm wondering, okay, how transient is this effect? How, How long, long is it going to last? Yeah. And, and uh, if it does persist, what's the mechanism? Is it because the cells live a long time? 
is it because you've you've uh, really impacted uniformly a huge population of these cells? So those are all those all feed into this question of how long is it going to persist and and how would it persist? It's not really answered in this paper. Okay, no. but it, those are questions no. that are in my head. Yeah, but and the, you know the the BCG effect is a couple of months. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that those questions are perfectly well answered in the field, Rich. Uh, um, I think that epigenetics can uh, or epigenetic marks can persist through mm -hmm. cell division, but it's not. I don't think it's clear how many rounds of cell division um, it lasts through, uh, and so whether maybe the first set of progeny cells might have some similar epigenetic changes. Um, that may be the case, but maybe the 10th mm. generation no, does not kind of thing. Um, I think people are still trying to work out many of those exact issues. And just to clarify for my own, uh, for my own sake, the alveolar macrophages, the way you described it, I have the impression that uh, they persist doing their job throughout my lifetime by uh, replicating at that site, some of them are alveoli. some of them are replicating like, in that site, and some are coming from the bone marrow to join them. Right, those are the other guys. Yes, yeah, mm. those are the infiltrators. Which has been that shown we that the okay. it's been shown actually someone at McGill and like in collaboration with one of the labs on my floor, they showed that in CCR two deficient humans, so people that are lacking like this chemokine mm. receptor that's important in infiltrating monocytes, that um, they have severe pulmonary disease, and they see that those upon like multiple rounds of infection their whole life with like many pathogens, obviously their lungs are very compromised and they have like a really aggressive phenotype. I think it's similar to cystic fibrosis. And they see that their alveolar macrophages are completely different from a CCR2 sufficient human because they're seeded with these monocytes that aren't uh. yolk sac derived alveolar macrophages. They're actually different cells. They're not necessarily, they're transcriptionally very, very different if they're seeded from the bone marrow during infection versus those that were there from birth, which is interesting. They're like special. They're not necessarily the same as any monocyte that's going to come out of the bone marrow. Um, uh, it, it, is it okay for me to think of these as? Uh, sort of like, I mean, is this, should I think of this as almost a tissue or are these a bunch of individual cells hanging out? Okay. Because I'm fascinated well, a, by the fact that I'm cells. full of cells so, that are like amoeba or something like that. Someone on that my have floor. have my genome in them that are working <laughs> for me. Right? Someone on my floor actually does intravital imaging of the lung of alveolar macrophages. And she gave a presentation last week. Uh, and at, at McGill and it's so cool. So they're literally just like each, she had like images of the alveoli itself and you can see them like, um, emitting prolongations into like the lumen of the alveoli and then grabbing back. So they're literally just like, hmm. they go, they move very slowly, but they're kind of like around the alveolar sac. They're just kind of hanging out around there, uh, sampling the lumen, like sampling for pathogens, sampling the air constantly. And, but they're not like a tissue in themselves. They're around the actual because you know how the alveoli are little tiny sacs they're kind of in the periphery in the periphery of there they're always just hanging out there kind of patrolling sampling yeah, so they're on my they're they're my own personalized little amoebae doing work for me Correct. Right? <laughs> okay yeah. they're patrollers you know, the, way, the way i see it, it doesn't have to be long-lived because you get a lot of infections right mm -hmm. every couple of months yeah. probably you may get infections you don't even know about and they are re returning on this epigenetic program and Maybe that's True. that's how it's been selected evolutionarily. As they put it in this paper, I think in the discussion, it's the onslaught of respiratory viruses. The onslaught. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're uh, we're under attack all the time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Under attack. Okay, so we've established that SARS-CoV-2 infection of mice and probably humans uh, results in these epigenetic changes at immune gene, but it, does it work that way? Can you do an experiment to show that? These things are on, and if you tickle them, they're going to come on faster than you would. So that's what they do. They take um, airway resident macrophages from mice that have either been recovered from SARS-CoV-2 or naive mice. They put them in culture, and then they add to them uh, pattern recognition receptor agonists, so mo molecules that would turn on innate immune responses. And then they measure gene expression changes. So they use things like poly IC and lipopolysaccharide and et cetera. And yeah, in in recovered macrophages, 
the expression of these genes are, they say, hyper-induced compared to the recovered mice. You know, there's a lot of data here. We don't need to go through it all. But essentially- I thought that was a really cool experiment. Just like different yeah, TLR agonists right? and yeah. Yeah. Like and, agonists. And that's, yeah, and that's really key because, hmm. um, you know, we've talked about this as being not specific um, with innate exactly. immune responses. And many of these agonists are things that are not part of SARS-CoV-2, um, lipopolysaccharide being the, the most mm -hmm. famous and the most obvious. And so the cell has previously seen SARS-CoV-2, has been changed by that, um, by these epigenetic changes, and now responds to something completely different, LPS, yeah. um, Although in a better way. Although LPS signals through TLR4, and it has been shown that SARS-CoV-2 can also activate TLR4, so maybe it's not so crazy. <laughs> Even though LPS is from bacteria, but it's interesting that it's activating yeah. the same TLR as SARS-CoV-2, which is also weird that it activates TLR4 as a virus. But, you know, I forget who showed that. Though. I forget which paper that was from, but I remember like during the pandemic um, that was shown. So um, one of the agonists they use is poly-IC, and they say, so we have these cells from recovered animals show hyper-responsiveness Poly IC in the form of robust re induction of ISGs and antiviral cytokines. They also infect these macrophages with VSV, and they are less susceptible to infection. These hyperreactive, uh, and, and they also do an infection with influenza virus, and they they see hyperinduction of nuclear um, genes related to uh, antiviral activity. And poly-IC mimics um, double-stranded double RNA, RNA, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a, that's a viral. So pattern. in other words, these epigenetic changes induced by SARS-CoV-2 infection, which you think should be working in a way, are functional. They lead to hyperinduction uh, after treatment with these pattern recognition receptor agonists or infection with a couple of different viruses. So SARS-CoV-2 gets everybody riled up. Mm -hmm. The alarm is still going off. Watch out for viruses. And other viral triggers are then more easily yep. active. They also do the same kinds of experiments in long-term alveolar macrophage cultures. So these are primary uh, cultures that they can get to live for up to, th well, at least they live three months and they have the right surface markers for the cell type, and they expose those to uh, poly-IC and measure transcriptional responses. It would be and, cool to uh, do that in the mouse, because like in culture doing that three months out is interesting yeah. still, but like in the actual mouse, seeing if three months later, if those alveolar macrophages could still respond would be way more interesting. Well, it yeah. would be a very, I think this is still an interesting experiment, but I mean, it would be cool to see that in an in vivo if because it's a controlled environment, obviously. Like, as humans, we're always yeah. in contact with viruses. It's hard to do that. But in our mice, challenging <laughs> well, them three months okay. after. Uh, turnover question now. Three months is a long time in a mouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in humans, maybe it turns over in three months. Would it also last that long in mice? I guess it's what we were talking about before with Brianne and Rich. Like, how long the macrophages, if they live, let's say, a few weeks, then... They should within a few months, but you'd have to show how long a macrophage lives, I guess, in the lung right. to yeah. be able to know. Yeah. And if unknown. the epigenetic changes, yeah, yeah unknown. exactly, unknown. So, so Angela, they didn't do exactly your experiment. What they did is they gave mice poly-IC experienced alveolar max, right? Oh, yeah, that's true. They before that. infection, and that mm. uh, reduces their weight loss. Mm -hmm. So if you give these experienced cells that have been treated with poly-IC to mice, uh, and then infect them, they do better, right? Mm -hmm. So they say that this uh, establishment of this this um, transcriptional state, chromatin state, in alveolar macrophages alone, right? That's what they're using is enough to uh, control the pathology of infection in mice. I sort of think of it as a passive, yeah, uh, exactly. innate immunity. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay, so now let's do the experiment in mice. Let's do two viruses, right? We're going to infect first with SARS-CoV-2, and then we will infect with um, influenza virus, a sublethal dose 
All right. And so, this is 30 days. Uh, I was looking for the number. It must be here yeah. somewhere. 30, 30 days, days 30 after the initial days. experiment, which uh, in the first figure showed you by then the virus is cleared. The mice are completely recovered, apparently. Yeah. Okay. And so you've established this state. But in terms of length of memory and all that kind of stuff we've been talking about, in this particular case, we're talking about 30 days. So in the naive mice, they get the normal weight loss uh, associated with influenza infection, and that is reduced in the um, the mice that have gotten first SARS-CoV-2. It partially protects them. I mean, this is a sublethal model. They don't die. So we're just looking at weight loss as a as a measure of pathology. Um, and Which they want to know- um, what, Isn't PR8? Sorry, Vincent. Yeah. I have questions. So I was going to do the MA10 strain. I think in this case, compared to like influenza A, PR8 is less lethal normally. Like PR8 is very lethal in mice. And in this case, yeah. we could say that the SARS CoV 2 is less virulent, which, right? SARS CoV 2 is the first virus, right? Mm hmm. There's exactly. Not, it's right. not lethal at all. And then you go in with a sublethal dose of PR8, because as you say, it's lethal if exactly. you too much virus. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's what you need. You can't. Mm -hmm. Although it would be interesting to put a lethal dose in and see if it's not lethal anymore if they got first SARS-CoV-2, but they didn't actually do that. That's what I, exactly, like the, which I think is like whatever it is in influenza, would that still kill the mouse, yes or no? Yeah. All right, so the, they, you know, we know that alveolar macrophages are a big part of this. They want to know if other cell types are involved and they, they go through a number of immune cells. Um, T -cell de they do T-cell depletion experiments. Doesn't affect the, the recovery in these mice. Um, but if they deplete airway resident macrophages with liposomes, then it removes that protective effect. And if they transfer those airway macrophages from a SARS-CoV-2 infected animal into a new mouse, it protects them from body weight loss caused by PR8 virus. That was cool. Yeah, mm. it was pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. And so I think the, you know, the experiment that would be cool, though, would be so much work because any of these experiments in and of itself is a lot of work would be yeah. to do the SARS-CoV-2 and then influenza at different time intervals. And so you can kind of see how long that mm -hmm. protection would last. Yeah, that would be. And they get rid of monocyte derived alveolar macrophages with antibodies against CCL2, right? We were talking about this before, mm -hmm. Angela. And it doesn't matter. They don't make much of a contribution. Just but also, animals. like, caveat, CCR2 is only actually up when they're infiltrating the tissue. Once they enter the tissue, they downregulate CCR2 and they increase other chemokine receptors. So mm. I don't know actually how relevant it is from blocking it in this case yeah. after the fact. But I don't know. I'd have to, like, read more into detail. But CCR2 is, like, an acute thing when they're just, just to get to the lung. Once they're in the lung, they downregulate it. Oh, and then they did the experiment I just said. They do a lethal PR8 infection. <laughs> oh, they did do so it. Oh, I missed they, that. They want to know if SARS-CoV-2 first can prevent lethality associated with uh, a lethal dose of PR8. And um, they uh, see no difference in RNA or virus levels in, in a naive or a SARS-2 infected animals. So naive PR8 or SARS-2 PR8 infected animals. So virus reproduction is the same. Uh, but the SARS-2 recovered animals survive, um, and they have less hyperinflammatory responses. So they say severe influenza is largely driven by hyperinflammatory responses, and you can measure pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines that are reduced, that are involved with that. And if you first infect with SARS-CoV-2, those levers are down when upon PR8 infection. And so that's why you're reducing the mortality there. Interesting. Uh, okay, so I hadn't, uh, I hadn't realized that. So the, so the impact, at least in this experiment, of the prior SARS-CoV-2 infection is not on the virus replication in the right. second infection, but on the character of the immune response. Seems to be. So yeah. it is not as inflammatory, and that saves your bacon. It does. Interesting. And finally, they take out BALF from these animals that get either, that get PR8 with or without SARS-CoV-2. 
and they identify increased expression of the genes that they predict to be increased uh, by their chromatin modification uh, studies that we've seen before. So that's pretty cool. That's that's the paper. I thought that was pretty interesting. So yeah. uh, it's fascinating. Super so I cool paper. Uh, I wonder several things that obviously are beyond the scope of this paper. So do different uh, pathogens uh, induce a different pattern of this sort of epigenetic mm -hmm. change? Good question. Yeah. And uh, likewise, uh, is the impact on a second pathogen? I mean, do do uh, other super infecting pathogens? Is, is there a difference uh, in how suppressed or not they are? Okay, are there are and are there different pairs? Okay, there's all sorts of games you could play. Yeah. with. Yeah, well, I think that before thinking about this paper, um, when I thought those, I thought you know, those were all open questions in a lot of parts of trained immunity. Um, but the one thing I hadn't really thought about before this paper was the idea that all innate immune cells were not going to be equivalent in their ability to do trained immunity. Mm -hmm. And so here, they're really getting at this idea that it's specific to the alveolar max. The alveolar max are somehow special in being able to do trained, this trained immunity. Now, that might be a pathogen-specific thing. Both in term, both in terms of the in initial infecting pathogen or the second infecting pathogen, um, but so to me that sort of makes Rich's questions even kind of more interesting. Is does that depend on which immune cell is involved? And so it's you know I originally would have said like all I mean I wouldn't have said all macrophages are the same for other reasons, but. I would have thought about them all being pretty similar in terms of their trained immunity. And so now I can say, oh, okay, different macrophages are going to do this differently. And that then overlays on the, well, how does the, the initial pathogen change this? How does the second pathogen change this? And then how does the um, cell type that wow. is being impacted also affect this, which is what I'm you know, the, the additional variable that I'm getting from this paper is the cell type matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so should... what about, this is all uh, respiratory pathogens, right? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. about a gut pathogen? Is, sure. there, is there an alveolar macrophage equivalent in guts? There are many oh. <laughs> specialized immune cells in guts. Okay. Um, but the specialized immune cells in guts work a bit differently than the alveolar macrophages because um, they the... Uh, gut is seeing so many antigens that you don't want to respond to. And so you have to have kind of a a right. different, I, I can't remember what you called it, tenor perhaps, of the immune response in the gut because you don't want to be making responses to mm -hmm. all your food. And so again, the, the organ or the tissue type um, becomes sort of another variable. And there is, there is immune crosstalk between those tissues too, 100%, right? One hundred percent, yes. You bet. Wow. So I'd like to change the name of these alveolar macrophages that have already experienced uh, one infection as educated. <laughs> so you, you go to college, you learn your lessons, and you apply them, not, not necessarily to the stories that you've heard in school, but also in reality. <laughs> and you continue to you know, adhere to those educated things. I, I wanted to ask whether or not these cells, you said they live three or four weeks. Uh, but in three months, the epigenetic change in the in the pre proceeding cells that are produced by the initial educated macrophage continues on, continues the lineage. Uh, they the hand cell. down the lore. Yes. Yeah. They well, they all they well, we all don't know that, get the benefit right? of a of a of a. Um, they they uh, let's see what would they you call should it? Hand it down, they hand it down some because the. Um, Histone is actually physically transferred um, from the parental cell to a progeny mm. cell, though oh, it may wow. not be, you know, as many marked histones because they're going to be diluted out. So we know there yeah. is some transmission mm -hmm. between right. generations of the cells, though all of the details of that are not super well understood. But yeah, Dixon, everything you're saying, I totally agree with. I think that's why I tend to use trained mm -hmm. immunity 
um, trained immune instead of any <laughs> immune memory, because I think that it's the trained is how I'm saying educated, just like what you're saying. Yeah, you're yeah, yeah so, no, no, good, good, good. So, Brian, I didn't really realize the um, sort of debate, I guess, about trained. And after I finished this paper, I thought, oh, I like this term innate immune memory better than trained. But yeah. if if you want to take out the memory part, for whatever reasons, it's not the same kind of memory. And so you use the word trained. To me, it would have been helpful from, you know, even four years ago when we first started hearing about this, if it was, and maybe it was, and I just never picked it up, if it was trained innate immunity. To, like, to me, trained immunity was was this whole new wild yeah, concept. I, I know exactly. I 100% agree with you. And I also, um, the problem just, is that there are some <laughs> examples of it um, in cells other than macrophages right. that, are, that are not innate immune cells. That are messy in terms of whether they're innate or adaptive immune cells. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was going to ask okay. about NK cells. Imagine that. There's a complication in the immune system. So NK cells uh, would be interesting to look at I, as well. So they? NK cells were actually the first place that trained immunity was described, and they were the cells I was thinking of when I said there the messy go. cells to Kathy. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. I actually looked at NKs and didn't find them participating in the, in mm -hmm. the yeah. system anyway. You know, no, I've, always, yes. I've always had this feeling that once I recovered from a cold, I was cold. I was safe for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, here it and is. And this, this sort of right. validates mm -hmm. that. You know, it's it, interesting, though, like at the beginning of the flu season, I wonder if this influences how you get so sick from any first virus that you encounter. I wonder if this contributes at all. But then during maybe. the flu season, you kind of feel like you're, like Rich said, you're kind of like invincible to the viruses during the flu season. You get like <laughs> microdose on all these antigens. I wonder if the alveolar mm -hmm. macrophages are protecting you during like the three or four months yeah. that we're like assaulted with all <laughs> of these viruses. Actually, we've also talked uh, significant uh, a lot about how during the pandemic, um, uh, other infections bottomed out. Okay? And we've right. always attributed that to the fact that uh, people were taking extra care not to get infected, which it makes perfect sense that probably most of all of it, but you you, you have to wonder, mm -hmm. okay, if maybe this yeah. doesn't but, play a but role. But some infections, some infections did not, like rhinoviruses kept going. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. And right. probably because they're not transmitted in the same way. Right. So right. wearing a mask doesn't help. Right. Well, also... You can think about it that if it's not transmitted in the same way, it may not be impacting alveolar macrophages. So it may be a different yeah. cell type. Yep. True. Um, yep. And of course, you can also then think about, well, some pathogens are going to immunosuppress to other pathogens. Ah. And so, it, so it's, it's all complicated. True, so true. The, the if the rhinoviruses stay in the upper tract, they're never mm -hmm. going to encounter these exactly. alveolar. Exactly. So exactly. That, like common cold coronaviruses, yeah. too, they, they replicate in the upper respiratory yeah. tract. Are there, so are there upper not... tract macrophages? Yes, but they're not alveolar macrophages. <laughs> they're, all, they're macrophages everywhere. They're, they're macrophages they're everywhere. In the upper tract, yeah. They're tracheal uh, macrophages. There probably so are they, some, but I, I don't know about them. Yeah, so maybe they don't undergo this. By the way, I think the use of memory is wrong because in immunology, we associate that with antigen specificity, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. So that's why a different word is yeah, needed, that, like training. So trained innate immunity, if you just add innate, I agree with Kathy, would make it so yeah, much more but clear. but Brianne already explained why innate doesn't work for things True, like the NK cells. True, the NK cells. Right. Yeah, it becomes... Minus so, trained largely innate immunity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so when I, I know that when I hear the word trained immunity, I'm generally thinking along innate lines. Mm -hmm or with some of the other messy cells, um, including mm. NK cells. Um, whenever we are finished with this conversation, because Vincent had an immunology joke before, I have another re relevant <laughs> immunology joke. Yeah, I just want to read their yes. last sentence. Mm -hmm. One can imagine that in the real world onslaught of respiratory pathogens, the induction and duration of antigen independent innate immune memory, along with the timing and nature of pathogen exposure will have significant impact on infection outcome, which is what we've been saying for the last 10 minutes, basically. Uh, and also for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes, if they're for trainees or budding scientists out there, we've asked enough questions to keep generations of scientists <laughs> busy uh, doing important That's stuff. Yeah. This is great. We'd, we'd love to know your answers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Brian, go ahead. All right. So this is a joke I'd actually heard before, um, but it was also, um, there was a, article in the Atlantic talking about immunology 
Um, that was published in 2020, and it was actually quoted in that. So I pulled up the article so I could get the joke correct. <laughs> um, and the joke is, an immunologist and a cardiologist are kidnapped. The kidnappers threaten to shoot one of them, but promise to spare whoever has made the greater contribution to humanity. The cardiologist said, well, I've identified drugs that have saved the lives of millions of people. Impressed, the kidnappers turned to the immunologist. What have you done? They asked. The immunologist said, the thing is, the immune system is very complicated. And the cardiologist <laughs> says, just shoot me now. <laughs> I have heard that joke. I have. Yes. So I have a, a very quick one. Why do people in Hawaii not get very sick very often? It's because they're protected by El Il Oahu. Il like Oahu. interleukin Oahu. Okay. Well, I L I S L E, except the I L. Yes. Uh-huh. You have to see it in print. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This wow. is what think, you get uh, when you have all of us together. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I really appreciate. Uh, the the uh, immunology expertise. I learn a lot with this. This is great. This is the whole point of TWIV, that you get a bunch of people together and you just let them talk, right? <laughs> the paper is a framework for us to to talk, and it works really well. Okay, let's uh, do some picks. Which, since we have so many of us, it's going to take a while. <laughs> so we'll go right to the picks. We have some great emails, but we'll do that next time. Angela, okay. what do you have for us? So these pics, I couldn't resist. Choosing my pick of the week was very difficult, but these pictures are so beautiful. Uh, so I chose Nature's October Best Science Images. Uh, and so there's a video, actually. There's a, if, you, if you click on the link, uh, we'll attach it to the show notes. But there's this video of the evolution of a star. It's 18 seconds. And you can see the, the Hubble telescope took this, this image between 2014 and 2023 of this star. I believe it's called A. Aquarii. It's a symbiotic star. So it's a system actually of two stars that orbit around each other. And it started as a red giant, about 400 times the size of the sun. And you can see how, how it evolves here in 2014 to 2024. And it's so beautiful, the image. Mm -hmm. And then some of the other images are, are hilarious. There's like a bald eagle that looks like it's getting chased by a fish. There's the... <laughs> um, Did he drop the, that fish or something? Looks probably, like. but it, it looks funny though, because it looks like it's chasing him. Uh, there's also some of the star, uh, the sun, so the solar power of the sun and how it's entered its solar maximum. And it gives some information about what that means for the solar cycle. But one of my favorite things is as you're scrolling, nature is so cool the way they do this, but like, as you're scrolling, you can look at cannabis close up. So, and you can actually look at like, it's as you scroll down, it gets closer and closer and zooms into like cannabinoids, which is obviously the psychoactive a molecule and has like medicinal uh, medicinal compound or components, I should say, or people are using it now medicinally. But just the the image is so beautiful mm -hmm. of cannabis, like so close up. I thought it was so gorgeous. And um, there are other you things. You could just like, take another toke and stare at it. <laughs> 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 and of course, there's sharks picking on like eating the flesh of a whale, which you guys know I love the ocean. There's some manatees that are adorable. So yeah, the manatee and the beautiful. jaguar. And the yeah. jaguar, yes. Terrestrial mammals are also cool. <laughs> wow, great stuff. Yeah, they, they, they have the same picture I saw before on another show, uh, the, al the, the lion killing the alligator. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so cruel. It's, right. it's, yeah, it's, but it's like, it's an amazing photo. But yeah, it is, yeah. it's like eating its brain. Nature's <laughs> tough. Well, I was in uh, Botswana. Red in tooth and claw. I was in Botswana mm -hmm. with my wife last year. And we witnessed the demise of a baby elephant at the uh, hands of an alligator. Yeah. So it's, it's a tough a, world. A give and take. It's give and take all the way through. Mm -hmm. Mostly take. <laughs> Brianne, what do you have for uh, us? So I was also in a interesting uh, photo kind of uh, m mood here. Um, I look at astronomy picture of the day every day uh, when I as my, the way I open all of my browser windows, um, and they have had things that were somewhat Halloween themed all week. And um, this, uh, the one on Monday, sort of combined two things that I really enjoy thinking about space and astronomy pictures of the day and thinking about bats, because there is a picture of something mm -hmm. called the Bat Nebula. Um, it's so cool. And so, in fact, the Cosmic Bat Nebula. Um, and so there is this great image of a nebula that oh, looks yeah. like a bat flying through a field of stars. And I just think wow. it's mm -hmm. super fabulous. Yeah. It's so cool. 
and they Rich, colored I, it in Halloween yes. colors. So it's it good. is. Yes, yes, it's orange <laughs> and black. Since Rich, Nicely I think done. you mentioned it like six months ago, the astronomy photo of the day. I also have it every day, and everyone in my lab is entertained by it when I open my Google yeah. and it shows up. Everybody. Yeah, I, there, I really think that there are days when I have to open gratuitous tabs just because I want to see the picture again. <laughs> yes, yes. Right, right. <laughs> well, I, I credit. That's a neat I, I just have it in my RSS feeds. I, uh, I credit uh, Kathy for turning me on to this. There you right. go. Thank you, Kathy. Everyone. <laughs> Dixon, what do you have for us? Well, as an annual pick, and I'm glad someone didn't notice this before. I did, unless you did. I, I, I've missed so many episodes. Maybe I'm wrong. But the Nikon Small World Contest winners for 2024 uh, have been published. And I invite you to just sit and your jaw will actually drop and hit the ground many times. Well, the cannabinoid one is number three. The yeah, cannabis that, one. Yeah, yeah, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the rage these days. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's right. Number two, electrical arc between a pin and a wire. I was look just at looking at that. that. So exactly. beautiful. Oh, exactly. Wow. Exactly. Something simple is so So beautiful. Elegant. It's elegant. There's a Which lot is of your elegant. favorite, Dixon? Uh, I don't have one. I, I love them all. You got to pick one. Otherwise, <laughs> big, big trouble. No, I like the one about the little uh, animal peeking out from its shell. Mm. Um, let's see which one that was. I haven't got the whole thing up These are in amazing. front of me yet. Uh, number 18. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's cute. Yeah. It's like, uh, is anybody out there? <laughs> if there is, I'm going back in. <laughs> the first one's gorgeous. The differentiated mouse brain tumor with the, you yeah, can see the yeah, actin, yeah, the microtubules. Yeah. That's so beautiful. They almost look like mushrooms yeah. and like fungus. So, <laughs> Brianne, you could have used number four to illustrate Richard's, uh, your answer to Richard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> At the villi. <laughs> We're getting better at this. We're getting yes. much better. Notice all the backgrounds are black almost. Mm -hmm. And that's a remarkable improvement over the last... 20 years worth of these pictures. This is uh, amazing, Dixon. They, well, <laughs> I'm happy to be able to point it out to you. I, I'm one just of these might become my old. background on my computer. <laughs> I don't know. Right now I have one of my confocal images of like a mouse ear, but this might be the new one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like anyway. this. Um, what is it? A, a slime mold on a tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> number 11 is another slime mold, and that got, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I also really 11. like 14, the crystal yes. of uh, hydroquinone cool. and myo-inositol. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. wow. I actually like 13, the green crab spider. <laughs> eyes. That, yeah. really that one's creepy. creepy. That one's yeah. creepy. It's amazing. With wherever you, the more you look, the more beauty you find. Mm. No matter how sinister the outcome of the uh, the biology of it, but uh, look at those cute little uh, octopi, a little <laughs> pod of octopi. Wait. Do you know how many eggs the average giant female octopus lays before she dies? She only lives four years. Do you know how many eggs she lays? Mm -mm. No idea. I mean, come on, Angela. I mean, uh, uh, that's not something that we learned in vet school. <laughs> they, don't cover that in vet school. they lay, lay 90,000 eggs. Whoa. 90,000. Dixon, Dixon, aren't there worms that do that in a day? Oh, but of course. Asterisk, I was going to say. I mean, you know, <laughs> these are innocent bystander providers, with, you know, and maybe 10 or 12 of them will survive all the way. You know, in addition 11. to the winners, there are also honorable yeah, mentions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. Images of distinction, and they're all amazing. Yeah. They are. They are. I don't know that's how you judge these. Wow. Yeah, that's oh, a good yeah. question. And there's a list of judges also at the bottom. You'll see who they are. Cool. Very cool. Wow. I'm glad you all like that. I love it. I, I love that have for us. I have a double pick. I got an email today from AAAS. AAAS is celebrating their 150th anniversary, and so part of this was oh, that wow. they have a video that celebrates scientists and. It's just a really feel-good video. They ha feature four scientists, Ellen Ochoa, who is an astronaut and director of the Johnson Space Center, Martin Polyakov, a chemistry professor from the University of Nottingham. And this is kind of like a nested pick. I didn't even go look at it, but <laughs> he's just an amazing person. And you, you have to look at the video just to see him. But <laughs> he's done videos on every element in the periodic table. And then he it. was having so much fun, he just kept doing more. <laughs> and then uh, uh. Prasanta Chakrabarti, who's a professor and curator of fishes at Louisiana State University, who also uh, talks a lot about science communication. And then Ayanna Howard, 
who's Dean of Engineering at The Ohio State University, whose specialty is robotics and artificial intelligence. So that is just cool because I think we all need something good to take our mind off of other things. And this (laughs) six minute video would would do that for you. And then the other part two of this AAAS email was that uh, AAAS and Science are hosting a webinar in November about Pew's 2024 annual Trust in Science survey findings. And you can sign up for this and they give a link for that. And it's going to include AAAS CEO, AAAS editor-in-chief, and a AAAS board member uh, and science policy communicator, Kathleen Hall Jameson. So uh, I wanted to get that in there in case anybody wanted to sign up for that uh, uh, discussion. It seems like it might be a good one to watch. (laughs) Cool. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Rich, what do you have for us? So I think it was my grandson, Porter, who first told me that cats are liquid. Um, (laughs) And uh, uh, I just, I don't know where I came across this, but I found this uh, little article in, um, uh, what is it? (laughs) Science Alert. Mm -hmm. uh, That says, titled, Cats are basically liquid after all. A study confirms, uh, and it goes on about uh, how cats can squeeze through small spaces, uh, basically. Yes. Uh, and I just, I just thought it was amusing. Uh, it, in fact, apparently, the study of the fluidity of cats won a nineteen seventeen, uh, a two thousand seventeen Ig Nobel uh, award. Okay, so <laughs> this is something that goes on, but I just think you'll find this uh, article amusing. In particular, the experiments that uh, speak to the fluidity of cats, and they are pretty remarkable. They can squeeze through pretty small spaces. Mm-hmm. I've seen pictures of cats in little vases, right, yeah. all squished yeah. in. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so it's true. So both of you, all three cat owners here, confirm this finding. Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I actually, I have a picture of one of our cats who was lounging on the couch one day. And the way his paws just kind of flowed and and like oriented themselves, I took a picture of it and I texted it to Laura and Sophie and I said, "Somebody left the cat in the sun and he melted." <laughs> <laughs> it, it just totally looked like he was a yeah. puddle. It's this uh, this article uh, at the top of the article is a picture of a actually it looks like um uh, uh, a rag doll. Yeah. Uh, yes. The, mm-hmm. the, that's the type of cat. Uh, curled up in a sink. So yes. wow. cool. Filling the uh, container. Yep. Yes. If you want to see another proof of that concept, uh, watch any video on uh, cheetahs running at full stilt. <laughs> yes. And their their entire body compresses and expands at a certain rate that's just remarkable. Remarkable. Well, what are they running from, Dixon? No, they're running to they're they're running running for. dinner. <laughs> They're running Not from fun. hunger. <laughs> Although they do run occasionally from lions and hyenas, but mostly they're running towards antelope. Hmm. Alan, what do you have for us? I have, well, before I get to my pick, Brianne's pick reminded me of a chemistry joke, so I'm going to subject you to it. Mm-hmm. 16 Third sodium day. atoms walk into a bar, followed by Batman. Mm-hmm. I have I have heard that before. Okay. Oh. Um, so now my pick. <laughs> Uh, this is on the. Uh, we seem to be on a on an imaging theme here. This is uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute's beautiful biology site, and That's it's just fantastic. awesome, beautiful yeah, images. And fantastic. if you um, you there's a button where you it says launch visual spectacle, yeah, 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 and yeah. it will it will play an animated That's right. presentation That's right. That's of these. Right. It's a really really well done site. Yeah. You can also. Um, uh, browse the whole collection if you want to scroll through them. It's uh, lots and lots of amazing images. That's cool. excellent. That's very good. Quite wonderful. Uh, my pick is an article in Science Based Medicine uh, by Allison Nietzel. EcoHealth Alliance Fights Back. It's a great summary of what EcoHealth has been through. Um, and she she be, opens it by this sentence, as I've recently discussed, the evidence lacking COVID-19 lab leak theory <laughs> has been part of a right wing partisan effort published, pushed by the GOP led House Select Subcommittee on the Corona Pandemic, the Heritage Foundation 
and established pandemic political bad actors. And they talk about how uh, EcoHealth has been made a scapegoat and accused of starting the pandemic, which shows none of these people understand what they were doing, right? He was working on SARS-1, not anything close to SARS-2, but they don't care. It doesn't matter. It's, you know, the, so this is the stupidity of this. And uh, as you know, Peter Dashak has been on TWIV a couple of times. And um, <laughs> recently I, I met him at a, at a, at a fest, fest for Ian Lipkin. And I said, Do you, can you come back on TWIV and, and tell me what's going, tell us what's going on? He said, well, since you already ruined my career, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> because uh, one of the interviews I did with him in Singapore in 2019 has been used as proof that he started the pandemic, him. right? Mm. Which is silly. But anyway, uh, now, finally, EcoHealth has published a document um, in, in rebuttal, and they, they link to it here so you can download it and check it out. 146-page response fighting back at the congressional and public's meeting. I mean, this is totally politically driven, although, as they point out, the Democrats made very little defense of him because they just don't, don't understand, I guess. They don't understand what to do. Um, and, you know, now that uh, that last paper came out, which we did on the tracing of the animals at the market, it's quite clear it began at the market. I think this gives EcoHealth a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, ammunition. Although she writes, unfortunately, it's unlikely that the GOP and their allies will drop the narrative anytime soon. This is not about facts. No. They don't want to know. Remember the great Barrington Declaration? We talked about oh, that yeah. way yeah. at the beginning of the pandemic. What yeah. a crock of... You know what? The town of Great yeah. Barrington was very upset about that, yeah. by the way, because yeah. it was it was bad. It's a lovely New England town up in the Berkshires, and, and they got smeared by this stupidity true anyway uh check it out if you're interested in how eco health is responding to this i mean one of the things they they were late in a progress nih grant progress report so that was used as an excuse to bar them from future funding is that ridiculous i mean yep that's an overreaction they're just looking for something because they have nothing else right mm -hmm. Um, interestingly, I, I ran into a lawyer a few months ago. I hope you didn't who, hurt him too badly. <laughs> <laughs> who was part of the defense of EcoHealth. It's really interesting. People you just run into. And <laughs> anyway, um, we have two listener picks. One is from Hunter, who's a, a DVM, a retired food animal veterinarian, writes, I thought the whole team would appreciate this pick, but felt Angela should read it. It combines okay. three topics near and dear to the, her heart. So you can read it. So Hunter writes, Twiv team, I thought the whole team would appreciate this pick, but felt Angela should read it. Oh, sorry. Yes, Angela should read it. It combines three topics very near to her heart, veterinary medicine, astrophysics from her sister, animal welfare, and perhaps four if she's a queen fan. Uh, so I think, uh, let me see, uh, I clicked on it briefly before and I think it was just showing that the tuberculosis was, they thought the tuberculosis was, um, from the badgers was infecting cows, I believe, mm -hmm. or vice versa. Um, because this, this guy, Brian May, Brian May. she's not a Brian queen May. fan. No. Not a queen <laughs> fan. I'm not a queen fan. No, I'm not a queen fan. Okay. He's, and he, I know he's an astrophysicist, though. He, he's, he's a rock icon. <laughs> I know, and, but he's not. I'm too young, I think, to be and, like uh, yeah, a queen Yeah, that's fan. fine. That's fine. I could be. And but, he's uh, an astrophysicist. That part I knew. Um, Kiata told yeah. me that. But the are the badgers carrying tuberculosis, I have to read this more specifically, but I think they were basically saying that, yeah, the badgers that are around the cows are carrying tuberculosis and he's trying to save the badger's lives, I believe, from what I saw. The idea quickly. that culling, so this is a big thing in the UK, um, that the, the, the theory that the badgers are transmitting tuberculosis mm -hmm. to the cattle and so they should cull the badgers yeah. and he's weighing in as a scientist saying this is probably not a great strategy. As an um, astrophysicist. He's also weighing in as Brian May. And as know, an, an astrophysicist. a certain amount of clout. Which is like, he, I think he would have maybe more clout as a, 
as a famous person than as an astrophysicist talking Both about TB and matter. badgers. Yeah. <laughs> but either way, um, thank you for the pick. I will definitely read this more in depth. Uh, Hunter, thank you so much. So Angela, you could be a Queen fan, even if you're too young, because if you like, if you heard their music and liked it, you would become a fan, right? But you just don't like yeah, it. Sure. Okay. I mean, I've heard it and it's like, okay, but it's not my, it's not my vibe. Okay. No. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> totally fine. Have you seen the movie Bohemian Rhapsody? I have. The, mo the movie is amazing. I, I do yes. like the movie. I do yeah, like the movie. It's pretty cool. Yes. We also have a, a pick from Anne who writes, Profesores di Virologia. David Byrne, the musician, created the Reasons to be Cheerful site to deliver a weekly dose of good news in the face of all the bad news we get. His parameters on what he selects. One, most of the good stuff is local. It's more bottom-up, community, and individually driven. There are exceptions. Two, many examples come from all over the world, but despite the geographical and cultural distances, in many cases others can adopt these ideas, these initiatives can be utilized by cultures other than where they originated. Three, very important. All these examples have been tried and proven to be successful. <laughs> these are not merely good ideas. They've been put into practice and have produced results. Four, the examples are not one-off, isolated, or human interest. Feel-good stories. They're not stories of one amazing teacher, doctor, musician, or activist. They're about initiatives that can be copied and scaled up. And Anne sends two links, uh, an article about how France is encouraging its next generation farmers, reason to be cheerful, and uh, at davidburn.com, a letter explaining Burns' reasoning for the website. Excellent. Cool. It's a good name. David Byrne is another rock star, Angela. You're probably too young to be familiar with I have with no idea who heads, that is. But... No idea. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I have a David Byrne story. What was the name of the band? Talking, Talking Heads. Heads. Talking Heads. Definitely so the bassist was... Um, yes. What, what was her name? Do you remember the Dawn basis? McGuire. What? Dawn McGuire. She was no. a medical student at Columbia. No, Talking yes. Heads. No, no, no. Yes, she say she played for Talking Heads. Tina Weymouth was the bassist. Tina, Tina Weymouth. Weymouth, other bassist. Yeah. Right, whatever. <laughs> but when I was a postdoc at MIT, there was a postdoc in Phil Sharp's lab named Lisa Weymouth. Oh wow! It was her sister. Oh, cool. And Tina came by one day. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Starstruck. <laughs> yes. A, a, a sample was sent to my lab once from downstairs where pathology was. The name of the patient was Ahmad Jamal. I thought for sure the pianist had been shot. This guy had been shot. No, he was a cab driver in New York City, but his him was the same as the famous jazz pianist. Man. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. That's right. Uh, Anne writes, P.S., please vote, everyone. Yep. By the time you hear this, it'll be- By the time you hear this, it's over with. Already we'll have done that, we hope. We'll have yeah. done it. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Twiv 1165. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Twiv. If you have questions, comments, or pics, please send them to Twiv at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy these programs, we do them with your support. We need your support microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. May I suggest the name of this episode? A Joyful Noise. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Well, it's a movie, but it's also the way of expressing ourselves together, <laughs> you know, as virologists and even non-virologists about it. virology. A okay. <laughs> Kathy Spindler is Professor Emerita at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com and al turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Brian Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Blue Sky. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. I learned a lot. And Angela Mingarelli is at McGill University at Immune Vet. I guess that's on X. That is on X. Yes. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. You guys learned a lot. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology 
and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you.